Ivanovich Institute. We are focused on how is knowledge formed. This has broad ramifications for our relationship to other cultures, for political diplomacy, for understanding the questions that drive the development of medicine, for understanding how human psychology and economics might go hand in hand. It's a narrow question with very big implications. We have faculty from all over the university. The problem of knowledge is very acute. We have to start with re-examining what we know. Why is it important to interrogate what you know, but you might be wrong? The Stepanovich Institute is a kind of concentrated essence of the University of Chicago. Thomas Kuhn was fully committed to being a physicist until he read Aristotle. He saw that Aristotle's physics was a closed system that made perfect sense within itself. He went on to write a book that showed us how generation after generation, even the definition of scientific truths can change. Constitutional law is too important to be left to the lawyers. To really understand how legal institutions work, one has to draw from political science, sociology, economics, the history of ideas. A question that comes up in the United States context quite a bit is why should we be governed by rules that were made by a bunch of men in powdered wigs 200 years ago? What relevance does that have for a world of the internet and you know, mass society? In the United States, we're a very diverse country, all kinds of interests, all kinds of uh, people spread out over a massive area. The Constitution is the thing which binds us together, and that's special. Um, but at the same time, there can be a little too much attachment to institutions that were adopted for a very different time and place. There are kinds of medicine and healing all over the world. Only one of them really cared about anatomy, and that was the European tradition of the body as a structure with lots of hidden structures inside it. That's a very strange idea in world history, and yet it has been the foundation of the rise of modern medicine. There are lots of Chinese concepts of the body, and there are some very different bodies at work in the world that we've been investigating. The history of science and the philosophy of science sort of go together. How scientists come to the theories, the demonstrations, of the evidence that they purport to have. So I became interested in Charles Darwin and how the theory that is manifest in the origin of species uh, came to be developed. How does someone come to these kinds of ideas that change the terrain of both not only biology but culture generally in the latter part of the 19th century and right through, through to the present? I've been interested in how the Chinese have reacted and still are reacting to the great Western political and classical texts. I've become very interested recently in the concept of the citizen, a concept that we take for granted in the West because it's 2,500 years old. This was not a concept in classical Mandarin texts. How is that possible? And what does it say about the ways in which we might be blind to what another culture knows or believes it knows? Africa is left out of these grand narratives of kind of world economic development. So I work on long-run economic development, just trying to understand why is it some countries are just much more successful economically than others. What's interesting about Africa, it gives you a powerful way of kind of challenging, you know, what you think you know about development elsewhere in the world. The research in Congo is trying to understand in some sense the sort of the causality between do particular types of people create particular types of states or do particular types of states create sort of particular types of people. So whether people really internalize this rule creating aspect of states. The University of Chicago is such a great place and it's absolutely the right context for an institute like the Stepanovich Institute. We have a very wide global footprint. We have centers in Beijing, Hong Kong, Delhi, and many other places in the world. The Stefanovich Institute can create a community of scholars. It's on a scale of ambition which is one order of magnitude up, even from normal kind of interdisciplinary research endeavors. For me, the Stefanovich Institute represents a space to grow in, a space to look at knowledge from the outside and see what factors shaped it in the past and are shaping it today.
Welcome. I'm Eric Isaacs, the Executive uh, Vice President for Research, Innovation, and National Labs at the University of Chicago. And I want to thank you all for joining us for tonight's program. This event is the latest installment of our discovery series, which is designed uh, for a broad audience uh, to include students, educators, uh, members of our community to learn about groundbreaking research that goes on here at the University of Chicago, both scholarship and scientific discoveries and their benefits uh, and to society. The series will provide audiences, uh, audience members with the opportunity to interact with the exceptional scholars that you'll hear shortly in a question period at the end of the, their presentations. At the University of Chicago, uh, scholars and scientists work across disciplinary boundaries and tackle global uh, challenges in medicine, economics, the environment, education, and energy, and more. And their work has led to many breakthroughs from uh, cancer, understanding the connection between cancer and genetics, evaluating the impact of social programs on the economy, and developing tools to produce reliably excellent urban schooling. Tonight's uh, presenters are University of Chicago faculty and their members of the university's Stavanovich Institute on the Formation of Knowledge. I'd like to note that we have with us Stephen Ashley Stavanovich uh, tonight, so welcome. Uh, although the series typically explores uh, major scientific advances, the Institute scholars will present a program that explores a broader set of questions around knowledge. The work conducted by these scholars who will take the stage shortly helps us to better understand both the world around us and how we see ourselves in it. By investigating what we know, uh, the facts we use as the foundations for both our research but also our daily lives, uh, we broaden our perspectives, engage more creatively, and perhaps bring uh, to our own work additional truths that can help us advance in exciting directions. The Stavanovich Institute was established in 2015 to unite scholars from many different fields to study the process of knowledge formation, the transmittal of that knowledge from antiquity to present day, and to explore um, how this history of this knowledge shapes our world today. The Institute functions as a research laboratory and incubator for University of Chicago faculty, visiting scholars, and offers support to, for affiliated PhD students and postdoctoral scholars. So tonight our moderator is a scholar and a teacher best known for his contributions to the history of science and evolutionary biology. Bob Richards is the Morris Fishbein Distinguished Service Professor of History of Science and Medicine at the University of Chicago. He's a professor in the departments of philosophy, history, psychology, and in the Committee on Conceptual and Historical Studies of Science. He is also the director of the Fishbein Center for the History of Science and Medicine. He is a scholar and instructor at the Stavanovich Institute. Bob is the author of six books, including most recently, Was Hitler a Darwinian? Disputed Questions in the History of Evolutionary Theory and Debating Darwin. He is the recipient of the George Sarton Medal in recognition of his distinguished scholarship and contributions to the advancement of the history of science given by the History of Science Society. So please join me in welcoming Bob to the stage. The theme this evening is against the norm. Opposition to norms uh, seems like a rather timely subject given our recent political experience. We're, we're delighted that a faculty, the faculty from a new academic center, the Stefanovich Institute for the Formation of Knowledge, will help us explore this theme. The Stefanovich Institute draws its members from all quarters of the university, from the humanities, the social sciences, the natural sciences. It explores the ways in which distinctive bodies of knowledge come into existence. For example, medicine in the fifth century Greece, BC, uh, interacts with other bodies of knowledge, um, say anatomy in second century AD, or sometimes disappears from intellectual life. Um, Medicine, of course, has not disappeared from intellectual life, but uh, certain branches have. Um, phrenology, for example, the art of depicting character by an un understanding character by uh, detecting the, uh, the valleys and ridges of one's skull. Uh, there is no department of phrenology in the medical school here at the University of Chicago. I'm a member of the Stefanovich Institute and believe with other members that exploring issues of knowledge formation requires an interdisciplinary perspective, 
You might say that the Stepanovich Institute is a kind of distillation, a concentration of the very ethos of the University of Chicago itself. Thomas Jefferson begins the Declaration of Independence with this assertion. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Jefferson expressed a norm, a presumptively absolute truth concerning the nature of human beings, that they have intrinsic rights, and the source of those rights comes from a, a, a divinity. But this Enlightenment view needs to be placed within the historical context of the 18th century, just as our discussion of norms uh, this evening will require putting that concept within the context of contemporary intellectual and cultural life. The research of our assembled faculty will help us do this. Their studies show, allow us to put the question, are forms of government constructed in light of the concept of a pre-existing human nature that has intrinsic rights? Or do governments create those rights and confer them on their citizens, such that at different times and different places, uh, different rights will be assigned, or sometimes no rights at all? We have four presentations this evening concerning norms. They'll each run about 10 minutes. After the last presentation, I'll call our panelists back to the stage and put a question to each of them. These questions will, uh, are designed to allow you to formulate your own questions to pursue these issues. Uh, and after they have answered those questions with clarity, distinctness, and sharpness, uh, then we'll open it up to the floor. Our first speaker is Shadi Barch Zimmer. Shadi is the Helen A. Regenstein Distinguished Service Professor of Classics and the director of the new Stepanovich Institute for the Formation of Knowledge. Shadi is the author of five books and is currently producing a translation of Virgil's Aeneid. She's uh, the recipient of enough awards to balance the budget of a small country, including a Guggenheim, and just last month, a residency fellowship at the American Academy in Rome. She's expanding her area of scholarship from Greek and Latin now to modern Chinese the modern Chinese language and also its history. She's going to talk about the impact of the political past on the present in two nations, the United States and China. Please welcome Shadi Barch Zimmer. Good evening, everybody. We've had a very strange electoral year. It remains to be seen what the ugliness, excuse me? <laughs> oh, <laughs> it remains to be seen what the ugliness of this year's political rhetoric will do to the presidency in general and to future elections. However, one thing seems certain. Out of this 2016 election, a clear winner has emerged. I don't mean the Democrats. I don't mean the Republicans. I mean the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. A recent BBC report reminds us that for years, the Chinese have been telling us that our democracy is in fact rigged by and for a few elite. Now, one of the presidential candidates has said the same thing. For years, we have been complaining that the Chinese throw their political enemies into prison. Now, our presidential incumbent has said that if he takes office, he will throw crooked Hillary into jail. The Chinese are having a field day with all this. They feel that American politics has been distilled essentially down to ed entertainment value and not much else. They suggest that the American voter is more interested in selfies and insults than in substantial political issues. 
And they also think that the American voter has lost, lost sight of the big picture. That instead of voting for the nation's long-term interests, people vote for individual immediate self-interest. So with this recent election, it seems the ideological gap between China and the US is continuing to grow. And in fact, most contemporary Chinese don't feel that democracy is necessarily a good system. What they point to is their own incredible rise out of poverty over the past 30 years. And they suggest, probably correctly, that if China were a democracy, it would not be able, in fact, to have doubled its standard of living every 10 years for the past 30 years. A 2013 Pew Global Attitude Survey reported that when Chinese were asked how happy they were with their government, 85% responded very happy, and when Americans were asked the same question, only 31% answered in the affirmative. So everybody thinks their own system is the best. But what's even more striking is that both sides also feel that their own system is the morally better system as well, not just the more efficient system. In 2013, the New York Times published an article that consisted of a document leaked from the CCP's inner corridors. It was a document simply called Document Number 9, and in it, the party leaders listed the seven great evils that they thought plagued the West. This document is very startling to us. Among the seven great evils, we have freedom of speech, human rights, the right to political participation. How can this be? Is this document a joke? Now, I grant you that one can be very cynical about this document, and one can see it as a move by the party leaders to keep Western ideas out of China. And certainly, there are all sorts of problems with corruption in China and with uh, the new cult of, the, of the, uh, the person at the head and so forth. But I submit to you that there's something else behind this document, that there's a part of it that reflects thousands of years of Chinese thought and that that part of the document is not at all cynical, it's actually very heartfelt. In other words, I'm suggesting that today's political rhetoric, both in the US and in China, is actually influenced by centuries and centuries of thought, not just the past 50 or 100 years of political debate. Here's an example of what I mean. In 1899, the word guomin was coined in China. This is the Chinese word for citizen, person of a nation. It was not coined until 1899, a concept that we've all lived with and that we consider a norm among human beings. The man who coined this word, Liang Qichao, was a journalist and a scholar who had read widely in Western literature, and who was keen for political reform in China. Unfortunately, when he published his work in 1899, China was still under the dynastic system, and the emperor Dowagers was not particularly keen on having Western ideas proliferating her dynastic system. So Liang Qichao had to flee for his life off to Japan. When the Qing dynasty finally fell in 1911, Liang Qichao came back, and at that point was able to talk more openly about his ideas. But they didn't really take. China went through several decades of civil war, and that ended in 1949, of course, with Mao Zedong taking power. And inasmuch as he was effectively the main or sole ruler of China at this point, there are some similarities between the Communist Party and the old dynastic system. Now, contrast the history of the West. For us, the idea of citizen is familiar all the way back to ancient Athens, a city-state in which every male citizen over the age of 18 
had the right to vote, to participate in debate in the assembly, and even the right to hold offices, because most of the offices at Athens were distributed not by vote, but by lot, so that even the most untalented person would have a good chance at holding political office someday. Not all the ancient Greeks thought this was such a great idea. Thucydides and Plato in particular thought that Athenian democracy would be a disastrous way of running a state. But even they agreed that while they didn't like direct democracy, still the most important thing any male human being could do was participate in his own political system. This gave meaning to life. This was the most important ideal. You're probably all familiar with Aristotle's famous quotation, man is a political animal. It doesn't mean that men were born to kiss babies and run for office. It means that the human being, qua human being, only finds fulfillment of all his potential in being an active citizen in a city-state. If you don't participate in politics, if you don't seize the rights of a citizen, you are not a human being. You are a god or a beast. Or in his other formulation, you are a bird who flies alone. On the Chinese side, on the other hand, what we have thousands of years of is the dynastic system. And obviously, in a dynastic system, your average person can't decide to participate in politics unless he or she was born into the ruling family. There was a court of elites who studied Confucian texts, there was the emperor and his family, but there were no mechanisms in place for political participation. As such, the need for a concept like citizen simply wasn't there. In fact, the Chinese thinkers of this era, like Confucius and Mencius, avoid talking about politics or the rights of the citizen in, in their discussions of what human beings should do. Instead of, focusing, instead of focusing on the rights of the citizen, what they focus on instead is the duty of the good human being. What makes a human being moral? And the answer to that question was certainly not participating in the emperor's court. It was showing respect and love to your parents and to the emperor, revering your ancestors, and most of all, knowing your place in the hierarchy. Confucius felt that social harmony depended upon people knowing their place in the hierarchy, and that as soon as people tried busting out of their natural position, the state itself would be in danger of collapse. A very different view of what is morally good than in the West. These thoughts and influences have continued down to the present day in China, just as ours, too, have continued down to our day. So, for example, just last year, a museum of filial piety opened in Sichuan. And people were encouraged to go to experience uh, what it really meant to properly revere your parents and your ancestors. Some Chinese companies even insist that their employees donate a portion of their salary to their parents every month. This ideology is well and strongly in place. On our side, we continue to focus on the rights of the citizen. We want rights. We believe we have the right to be happy, the right to be rich, the right to have our dissatisfactions addressed. We so much believe in these rights that it may be that Donald Trump came to power on the back of such beliefs. We've certainly traveled a long way from the much more restricted views of our own founding fathers some of whom, at least, were very skeptical about democracy and everybody having rights. You probably also know this famous quotation from James Madison in Federalist Papers Number 10. I'll just read the first part. Democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention, and have in general been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. That could be Xi Jinping saying that right now. So, what do I want us to take away from this extremely brief look at the past and present of China and the US? 
I want us to think about how it's very difficult to step out of the shadow of our own history of thought and to look at it from the outside. It's very difficult um, to be what one might say is um, somebody who recognizes their own context and can see it as not necessarily natural. As, are we, as we on our side are talking about rights, on the other side, the Chinese side, it seems that some of the old Confucian values are back with a vengeance. We have nationalism on the rise under Xi Jinping, a way of thinking that really privileges the good of the entire nation over the right of the individual. People come together to support um, activity in the South China Sea or to criticize Taiwan. People are happy to get wealthier, but they're not particularly interested right now, at any rate, in exercising those rights. They feel they have bigger fish to fry. So speaking of fish, my point is that we should try to see the water that we swim in instead of taking it for granted, or worse still, not seeing it at all. It's not clear whether democracy is a universal aspiration or merely a culturally rooted practice. But I think that as soon as we learn to ask that question, we are in a different place. We're in a place where we can relate more closely and with greater intelligence to our political other. Thank you. Thank you, Shadi, very much. Our next speaker is Judith Farquhar. Judith is the Max Plavesky Professor of Anthropology Emerita. Uh, she does research on traditional medicine in China, popular culture, and everyday life. Her anthropological interests include medical anthropology, the anthropology of knowledge, and the anthropology of embodiment. She's the author of some six books. Currently, Judith is the faculty director of the University of Chicago's Center in Beijing. She will talk to us about something that seems to be virtually identified with each of us, and I hope so. Anyway, it's their bodies. Uh, she's interested in embodiment, and particularly the way Western medicine understands the human body, and the way Chinese traditional medicine understands the human body. Uh, these are really quite diverse uh, perspectives. I think we're inclined to say they both can't be true, but Judith will help us reconcile these differences, I assume. Please welcome Judith Farquhar. Hello. We've been talking about citizens and with their apparently free and apparently rational minds, I want to talk about bodies, and altogether less certain, more inarticulate, more, uh, more difficult topic, really. Uh, and the way that I want to start talking about bodies today is by talking about the frozen shoulder that I had some years ago. Some of you have had this, I bet. It's a very severe pain in your shoulder that uh, doesn't go away. It, it's, ibuprofen does not help. And uh, you cannot raise your arm very far above your head. Well, I decided after a month of agony to seek out acupuncture treatment. And I went to see my friend Jun Wang. But I think before I tell you about Jun Wang, I should explain about acupuncture. It's a logical practice that works on things that we tend to think don't exist. The meridians, or the circulation tracts that run over the surface of the body. Fred here has uh, the 12 major circulation tracts marked on his plastic body. So I went to see Jun Wang, and she put needles in several parts of my body but not, fortunately, my frozen shoulder. That would have been very painful. She put needles in my lower arms, in my lower legs, and in my head. Once I was uh, comfortable again, she said, OK, Judy, let's raise that arm. I raised my arm above my head, 
I had no pain in my shoulder whatsoever. And the amazing thing was that at the very same moment, that very familiar pain appeared in my shin at the position of one of the needles that Jun Wong had placed. I was dumbfounded. I couldn't believe it. I said to Jun, oh my god, the tracks are real. Now, I had been working on Chinese medicine for over a decade by this time. And I thought I had been working in a very respectful way, taking very seriously all the things that Chinese doctors work on, all the techniques that they use. And yet, I needed to have that direct experience of a kind of flow in the body in order to accept the reality of the meridians. What did I learn from that experience? I learned, one thing I learned was that even when there are not visible structures, there might be functional pathways. So on Fred, for example, I could trace from the point where I was having such terrible pain in my shoulder, I could trace a pathway of action across his face, down his side, to the right shin. And uh, this would all make perfect sense if you accept the existence of the uh, functional pathways of the meridians. Now, functional pathways is kind of an elusive concept, I think. So I thought I would uh, step back a moment and talk about the body I thought I knew when I went to see Jun Wang. Uh, that body was, uh, is the anatomical body, the body that some of us put together when we were kids with our visible man kit. Um, this is a body that's full of discrete objects, and it's uh, structured, it stays in the same, everything stays in the same relationship to everything else for a long time. And uh, it's founded on a long history in the West, in Europe, of anatomy. Uh, anatomy based on the dissection of the human body that uh, resulted in uh, detailed drawings of bodies that were studied by teaching physicians and their students and that uh, depicted the visible structures of the human body. Now, when I look at these anatomical representations of human bodies, I often remember something that my Chinese medicine teachers in the early 80s in Guangzhou would, let, would say to me. They, trying to explain the difference between Chinese medicine and Western medicine, they said, historically, Western medical knowledge has been based on dead bodies. Chinese medicine, on the other hand, always learns from living bodies. I thought this was a rather profound remark, but looking at this clinical encounter, we can ask, how actually does the Chinese doctor learn from a living body? What kinds of technologies do they have to understand what's going on with bodies? Well, the body that this, the Chinese doctor works on is interconnected. So for example, the 12 major meridians on Fred start at the head. Many of them start at the head. They go down the arms. They go down the body. They, a, a number of them end in the feet. They make a U-turn, and they go back the other way. So that it's very possible to uh, influence remote parts of the body from different access points. Uh, so that you, you can actually start somewhere, and in the end, get everywhere. This is why people often call the Chinese medical body holistic. This is a diagram from foot reflexology, which is a rather bizarre subdiscipline of acupuncture. And it involves uh, massaging the feet to uh, reach the different organs and the different spaces in the whole body. Now, has any of you had a foot massage in China? Yes, we have. Several. OK, I have. And I found it very uh, comforting and uh, relaxing at first. But then the technician hit a point on my foot, which really hurt. And I said, ow. And she said, aha, you have chronic digestive problems. And I had to admit that I do. <laughs> <laughs> 
So what could I do about this, about my chronic digestive problems using foot reflexology? Well, I could use my handy-dandy home foot reflexology therapy kit, right? I could put those little boards on the ground. I could take off my shoes, which I'm not going to. Oops, they're backwards. I could take off my shoes, which I'm not going to do, and I could stand on these things and shift my weight around and give myself a fairly effective massage and gradually learn to feel the effects in the rest of my body. I didn't take my shoes off because it really hurts, and uh, I've, I've never learned to do it. Nevertheless, it's much more important for Chinese medicine to talk about the pulse, though. Every Chinese doctor always takes the pulse of every patient who comes to see him. Now, he's not just counting the beats of the, of the pulse against his watch. He's palpating the whole area of the wrist, and he's feeling for qualities. He, can, he, he, he's, he, he, he wants to figure out if the quality of the flow is rough or strident, sluggish, deep, shallow, hectic. There are 28 standardized pulse qualities in modern Chinese medicine. And uh, the, the pulse-taking doctor can tell something about the quality of the dynamics of the whole body from his palpation of the pulse. I want to finish by talking about uh, my old friend Caroline, who late in her life experienced in Maryland uh, a serious illness which she thought of as total digestive and intestinal collapse. She had a very hard time getting her symptoms under control with her general practitioner, so she tried an acupuncturist. Uh, and eventually, they did manage to get the symptoms under control. When I asked about her about it later, she said, Chinese medicine is different. You have to pay attention to your body. The changes it makes are subtle, and it takes time. In this process, she said, I learned things about my life that I never understood before. Now, I think that Caroline's story is also a part of medical history. It can uh, remind us that we don't have to just know the body as the visible man anatomy body. We don't have to just know the body as what we see in the mirror in the morning when we're wondering about whether our clothes fit properly. We can think of the body as the body that lives, and we can uh, perhaps work on, following Chinese medicine, work on minding the body differently. Fred thanks you. Thank you, Judith. Our next speaker is Tom Ginsberg. Tom is the Leo Spitz Professor of International Law and Professor of Political Science. Two of his books have taken top prizes from the American Political Science Association. His most recent book is entitled The Economics of Judicial Reputation. He's edited some 15 other books. He currently co-directs the Comparative Constitutions Project, which is an effort found, uh, funded by the National Science Foundation to gather and analyze constitutions of all independent nation states since the French Revolution. Tom will provide a sample of his research on constitutions. Please welcome Tom Ginsberg. So from the body to the body politic. The great political theorist Frank Zappa once said that in order to be a real country, you needed two things. You needed a national airline, and you had to have a national beer. <laughs> you might be able to get away without the airline, but you definitely needed the beer. These days, to the list, one would have to add a national constitution. For countries, as they emerge on the world stage, will typically, as one of their very first acts, adopt a new constitution. South Sudan, the world's youngest country, did this on the very first day of their independence in 2011. A constitution is a kind of a product, a product that embodies the fundamental values of the people, 
that provides a blueprint for governance and announces on the world stage that we are indeed here, that we are indeed a country. One way to examine the emergence of this norm is to look at data, such as that gathered by my colleagues and I at the Comparative Constitutions Project over the last few years. The top line in this figure shows the number of independent countries in the world since 1789. And you can see that that number has increased. It's about four or five times what it was in 1789. The dashed line indicates the number of countries that have what we could call a discrete national constitution, a single document. And the interesting thing is that over time, those two lines converge so that by about 1950, there's certainly a norm that to be a country, you need a constitution. The other thing the figure shows us is the number of constitutions adopted in any given year, given by the bars. That ranges from zero in some years to more than 20 in others. The interesting thing here is that you can see that constitutions, the quintessential embodiments of national sovereignty, actually come in waves. And these waves tend to follow great international conflicts. So the end of the Cold War, the end of World War II, decolonization. These major transnational events shape the production of national constitutions and trigger their rewriting. One reason there are so many national constitutions is that they tend not to last very long. This would have pleased, actually, our founding father, Thomas Jefferson, who thought in some sense that constitutions ought to be rebooted every generation or so. For Jefferson, the dead should never govern the living. And he thought, as a radical Democrat, that each generation had to choose their own institutions. Some many said, look at constitutions with sanctimonious reverence and deem them like the Ark of Covenant, too sacred to be touched. They ascribe to men of the preceding age a wisdom less than human, more than human. This is what he wrote in 1816. He was the man of the previous age. And so he himself had enough awareness to question his own handiwork. On the basis of this theory, he argued that all laws and all constitutions should expire automatically after a period of 19 years. He calculated this based on European life expectancies of the time, and it was the period, by his calculations, in which a new generation would replace a prior one. Through this mechanism, he thought that each generation would choose their own institutions, and that this would somehow lead them to adopt them on the basis of a democratic principle, but also, critically, allow them to update the institutions. As society changes, as technology changes, he thought institutions and laws had to change as well. Now, most countries seem to have followed Jefferson's advice. The United States has not. Um, but this allows us, actually, to look at trends in constitutional content over time. Uh, what are the trends? Just as we have trends in fashion, we have trends in hairstyle, so there are trends in constitution making and constitutional content. What this figure shows us is for each constitution, represented by a dot, the trend in the number of rights that are included in the constitution. And clearly one can see that we are indeed in some sense in an age of rights, of ever expanding claims of rights. A constitution adopted today would include rights that Thomas Jefferson and his colleagues never thought of. Rights to health care, rights to a clean environment, even a right to leisure. In this way, ideas about what rights we have are reflected in fundamental law, but only if there's updating and changing. Constitutional texts are also uh, embodiments of economic ideas. And so in this figure, you can see in the blue line, the percentage of constitutions, national constitutions, that make reference to the free market, a number that's been steadily increasing since 1940. In the red line, you can see the rise and then the fall of socialist constitutions. And so constitutions also embody ideas about the economy. Another thing we can look at is uh, God's position in the Constitution. In the 19th century, many constitutions would have prom been promulgated in the name of God. But as you can see, in the long secular 20th century, God suffered a serious decline in popularity, she seems to be making something of a comeback right now. Uh, but the point is that we can look at in these, in these documents for shared ideas, 
across countries about what they tell us about the nature of government and the basis of our fundamental institutions. In this sense, we have to reimagine our image of constitution making. Most of us think of constitutions as made by a bunch of men in a New England town hall, reasoning from first principles to optimal institutions. This is not really how constitution making gets done today. Indeed, one would have to describe it as much more of a transnational process. So if one was to go to, let's say, Nepal, which adopted a constitution last year, one would find um, all kinds of organizations, the logos of which are on this figure, which would show up to work with the national government in terms of what was going to be in the Constitution, in terms of designing its process. Sometimes these organizations have sort of positioned themselves as general advisors. In other cases, they come to lobby for very specific things. The point is that Constitution making now is very much a transnational process. And you might think that this is a, a kind of a, a bad idea, that it, it, it's an interference with the fundamental right of a sovereign people to choose their own institutions. Realistically, though, the people who are actually drafting constitutions, in most cases, have never done it before, will never do it again, are often not paying much attention, <laughs> and occasionally are so embroiled in their own uh, partisan politics and partisan passions that they can't ever come to agreement. In such circumstances, it might make sense for the international community broadly defined to subsidize these processes in terms of helping to structure them, in terms of providing ideas so that that Jeffersonian updating can be better achieved for the benefit of the population that is going to have to live under these institutions. Now this image here of Nepal might seem to some of you this week as a kind of warning, right? In some sense, it seems to embody the current state of American politics. And uh, for that reason, I want to spend a minute talking about the United States and the implications of the analysis for the United States. In this image, we have two ancient artifacts. On the right, the 229-year-old Constitution of the United States. On the left, the oldest woman ever to live a woman named Jean Calmet, who died in France in 1997 at the age of 122 years old. Now, they went to her and they asked, you know, what's your secret? How did you live so long? And she said, you know, I smoked till I was 117. Didn't, I quit, didn't make me feel any better, I went back to it. Her diet seemed to consist of chocolate by the pound, uh, along with some uh, copious amounts of port wine. I guess the point of the story is that very much like the United States Constitution, this might work for her, it's not necessarily a model for the rest of us. <laughs> if you are a country that is writing a new constitution, you're unlikely to use that of the United States. But I also think it tells us something about what we would do if, as human beings must all expire, if our constitution was ever to be replaced. Now scholars have been talking about this for some time. So many of our institutions seem so poorly fitted for a modern society. The Electoral College will, for many of you, be on your mind this week. The Senate, which seems so undemocratic in so many ways. There's lots of institutions that are problematic from a modern democratic point of view and that would never be adopted today were we to start over. One thing I'm sure of is that if we were to write a new constitution, we would be reflecting the ideas of the accumulated experience of this now 230-year-old era of constitution making, we would look at the experience and the ideas that flow from other countries in order to do a better job of reflecting our current moment. Now, if you're interested more in learning more about constitutions, I have this website, constituteproject.org. You can explore the ideas that are instantiated in national constitutions at your own leisure, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> Our final speaker is James Robinson. Jim is university professor in the Harris School of Public Policy. His main research interests are in comparative economic and political development with a particular interest in Latin America and sub-Saharan Africa. <clears throat> 
He, his most recent book, Why Nations Fail, has been translated into some 31 different languages. Uh, the Washington Post judged it one of the top 10 books uh, published in uh, uh, 2012. Jim is going to describe a natural kind of experiment occurring in Africa to test the effects of formal governmental structures on behavior as against untutored human impulses. Please welcome James Robinson. Thank you. So, so tonight we've learned that there's enormous variation in human societies. Different societies have different notions of what democracy is. They have different theories of how the body works. They have different sorts of constitutions. And I'd like to talk a little bit about how states and societies and people interact. That interaction also varies enormously across countries and in ways which we think have enormous consequences for people's well-being. In particular, I'm interested in the kind of nexus between effective states, the prevalence of rule violations in society, we tend to think that effective states are good at eliminating rule violations, and people's intrinsic willingness to be honest, their intrinsic honesty. Now, this also varies a lot across countries, and it's a relationship that's been interpreted in a particular way by the social scientists and social theorists who've thought about it. On the horizontal axis here, I have a measure of the prevalence of rule violations in different societies. You could think of that as the effectiveness of the state in enforcing the rule of law, eliminating corruption. On the vertical axis, I have a measure of the extent to which or the proportion of people in different countries that are intrinsically honest as measured by uh, data for an experimental game. I'm going to describe that game in more detail in a little bit. But for the moment, just think of that as people's intrinsic honesty. So you can see, if you look at the picture, that in countries which have effective states, they're very good at stopping rule violations. Sweden, UK, Netherlands, Germany. There's a much higher proportion of people that are intrinsically honest. Whereas in countries like Tanzania or Georgia, for example, where the states are much good, uh, sorry, the state is much less good at enforcing rules and preventing rule violations, people tend to be much less intrinsically honest. Now, the people who've thought about this relationship, such as the sociologist Norbert Elias or the philosopher Michel Foucault, have tended to assume that its effective states create a different sort of people. They create intrinsically honest people. You have a state that enforces the rules, people adapt to that, people internalize the rules, people become intrinsically honest. But you know, looking at that data, there's no reason why you, could read, you have to read it like that. It could be that you know, people in different societies have different sorts of social norms, different sorts of values, and intrinsically honest people are just better able at creating effective state authority. So I'm a social scientist. You know, how do you cut through the sort of Gordian knot of causality here and know what's really causing what? Well, the way you do that is with a natural experiment. So I've been studying a natural experiment uh, in the Congo Basin in Central Africa, and it's to do with the migration of the southern Mongo people. So in the medieval period, the southern Mongo people migrated from uh, the river Congo, which is up here, or the river, Kasa uh, the river Congo, yeah, the river Zaire, as it was known when this map was drawn by the historian Jan van Sina, they migrated, ooh, sorry, terrible. They migrated into the savannah around the confluence of the Sankuru and Kasai rivers. So they came with a common oral history, a common language. They all had a lineage. They claimed to be the descendants of a mythical founder called Woot. And some of them spread out to the west side of the Kasai River, and some of them spread out to the east side of the Kasai River. What's interesting about this is in the 17th century, to the east of the Kasai River, a process of state formation took place. A very effective centralized state emerged, the Kuba state. Here's the king of the Kuba in the 1940s, as featured in Life magazine. And you can see this is a serious monarch. He was a serious monarch running a serious state. There was a professional army, a professional police, a fiscal system, a very elaborate legal system with appellate courts. You could appeal, lawyers, the whole caboodle. On the other side, this is to the east of the Kasai River. To the west of the Kasai River, nothing like that happened. 
So here's people, common history, common culture, common language. They spread out across the African savanna, and some of them experience this process of the creation of effective state. So we can use this as an experimental-like variation to test what's the impact of effective central authority on people's norms, on people's willingness to obey rules. Now, why, why do you care about that? Well, if I back up and think about the Congo, the country where this is now, the Democratic Republic of Congo, you can see this is a state which is not very effective. Here's the hospital in Mushenge, which is the capital of the Kuba Kingdom. You can see there's not many people in it. There's not many people in it because there's not many beds, and there's not many of anything, really. There's not much medicine. There's not many doctors. So the Congolese state is very bad at providing services. Here's a rural school. Uh, there's no books. Maybe there's teachers. If there are teachers, they haven't been paid. Here's a freeway, here's a Congolese freeway. You can see it's a, like a mud track. They call this National Road Number One. Uh, you know, this is a sort of idyllic Congolese driving scene. If this was the rainy season, you, this road would be completely impassable. Okay, so here's a state which is very ineffective at doing the sorts of things we think states should do. And this is also a society where a lot of rule break breaking goes on. Okay, this is, a, this, is a, this is an informal roadblock I experienced in Kinshasa. This gentleman here with the AK-47 is a policeman who's thrown a barrier across the road to shake down anyone who comes past. So you have to give him you know, du sucre, as they say in the Congo, in order to get through on this road. So there's a lot of rule breaking that goes on. So we'd like to understand how do these things fit together. Okay, so, and we did this using this natural experiment of the creation of the Kuba Kingdom. Okay, so how did we measure intrinsic honesty or intrinsic willingness to obey rules? We did it in the following way. We put people in a room with a dice. Three sides are white and three sides are black. Here's how it goes. You have to think in your head a color, white or black. Let's say white. You roll the dice. If the dice comes up white, you take some money. If the, white, if the dice comes up black, you allocate some money to somebody else. Now you're in this room, only you know what you thought in your head. There's a rule. You're supposed to stick to rules, right? But if you violate the rule, you get the money. So there's nothing that stops you just pretending you win every single time and you take all the money, okay? That's not what people do, it turns out, but there's nothing that stops you doing that. There's a lot of variation across this. What we were interested, across people, across societies in this. What we were interested in doing, and this is basically the information I showed you to start with, in Germany, they think white, it comes up white, they get the money. If it comes up black, the Germans don't do that sort of thing. Okay, so, 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 so what's, what's the hypothesis here? What's the hypothesis we learned from the work of Norbert Elias or Michel Foucault? The hypothesis is that the Cuba had this effective state, judicial system, appellate courts, that Cuba people should be much more reticent to break the rules. Now, we don't know what's in people's minds when they play this game, but here statistics comes to our help. In the game, they have 3,000 Congolese francs to allocate. It's about $3. You should be right half the time, okay? Which means that you should know, we should know that you should be giving about 1,500 Congolese francs to this other person you're playing against. The details of that are not so important. Now, so if everyone was being honest, these, column, these bars here should all be up at 1,500 Congolese francs. So they're all way below, so everyone's cheating a bit, you know, everyone's cheating a bit. But what's interesting about this is the Kuba are cheating more. The brown bars here are how much the Kuba leave on the table for the other person. The gray bars are the average of all the other ethnicities we played with. So contrary to the hypothesis, the Kuba cheat more. They're less intrinsically honest. And maybe that's not so strange. Maybe if you have a state with effective institutions, effective legal institutions, you don't really need people to be intrinsically honest anymore because the state does it for you, okay? But why is that interesting? Why is that finding important? Well, go back to the Congolese state. People in the international community spend a lot of time talking about state building. We need to have state building. We need to promote state building. But no one talks about society building. If this finding is of general interest, then that first picture I showed you suggests that it wasn't 
effective European states that created law-abiding Germans. It might have been rule-obeying Germans that were able to create effective central authority. And I think that's an important lesson for thinking about how you move a country like the Democratic Republic of Congo out of where it is now to something different. Thank you. Thanks, James, very much. Now I'm going to invite our panelists to come up to the stage. And I'm going to put a few questions to them. And you might well be formulating your own questions that you would like to ask our panelists. So, Shadi, I'll begin with you. Um, democracy comes in many forms. There's, it was born in the fifth century in Athens. Uh, it seems to be alive and vigorous in 21st century United States. And to the naive observer, it looks like it's flourishing and spreading throughout the world. Am I right? Well, that's a difficult question, Bob, as you know. Um, it so happens that since 2000, 27 democracies have disappeared from the face of the earth. And other recent trends include um, the failure of the Arab Spring, the phenomenon that people given a vote will vote for an autocratic government, which will then take away their vote. Um, we've seen on the international arena, countries like Russia just taking what they want uh, in, the, this, in the case of the Crimea. So again, while it's difficult to predict, it seems to me that um, respect for democracy as an institution seems to be on the decline, and that recent events in our own society point largely to the same thing. Whoops. OK, thank you. Um, well, to Judith. Um, Judith, I'm a historian and philosopher of biology. To my ears, the idea that a part of your foot might control your digest, di digestive tract, I, I, that just sounds a bit implausible to me. So why should we pay attention to traditional Chinese healers when they talk about the human body at all and not rely on the accumulated scientific knowledge we have in the West about the human body? Why shouldn't we pay attention to them? Because <laughs> it sounds implausible. <laughs> it's implausible with a certain model of the body that you have. However, there's, there are plenty of um, uh, little mythical formations going on in clinical practice everywhere all the time. There's, there's all kinds of prejudice involved in the kinds of quick judgment calls that doctors make. And uh, that's as true in Chinese medicine as it is in biomedicine. The, the fact is that uh, Chinese medicine is effective for a great many conditions, especially chronic conditions that biomedicine is pretty... Uh, ineffective in dealing with at times. So it's not so much a matter of accepting whatever is the model of reality that underpins uh, a medical system as listening to the kind of practical and reliable knowledge that medical systems have, and I think we should be doing more of that. So experience trumps theory in this case. Uh, but let me put a question now to Tom. So I was um, a bit surprised to learn that after um, a decline, God is making a comeback, uh, at least as recognized by those uh, devising national constitutions. Are those constitutions also recognizing uh, certain intrinsic rights that human beings come equipped with, uh, the sort that Jefferson mentioned in the Declaration of Independence? Well, yes, there's um, always continuous updating in our thinking about rights. We might have a different set than Jefferson had, but um, we certainly are continuing to come up with new ones. And we might not always frame them in terms of being natural rights, but uh, we are certainly coming up with new claims. Some recent examples. The uh, Supreme Court of India has recently found a right to sleep is in, uh, in the constitutional uh, text. Um, uh, the Constitution of Ecuador very interestingly, the uh, most recent Constitution of Ecuador actually provides rights to Mother Nature herself, not just to human beings to enjoy nature, but nature herself is a rights bearer. 
and has, uh, through the agency of human beings speaking for her, successfully made some claims before their court. So I guess the, the point is that our ideas are always changing about rights, yet somehow we keep coming back to that idea that really originated in the Enlightenment period of rights as being an essential way to think about the relationship between people and their government. So Jefferson had it pretty much right. <laughs> uh, so the final question to Jim. Um, one, well, can one generalize from one case, even a case as interesting as you've provided, does it really inform us about the impact of governmental structures, say, in other governments uh, across the world? Yeah, so that's a good question. I think that's really about how representative was the Cuba kingdom of the other types of states we were looking at. And, you know, you could say the Soviet state, you know, obviously didn't inculcate a culture of, you know, obeying rules. You know, in fact, people claim the opposite. You know, there was a whole culture of blat, which was how to get around the rules and how to game the rules. But I think what's interesting about the Cuba kingdom is that, you know, this really looks like a sort of state along the lines that we think of when we think about European states or Eurasian states. Or, I mean, there's a lot of variation, obviously, but it wasn't a patrimonial state. It was a state with a professional bureaucracy, with social mobility, as I say, with very elaborate judicial institutions. It's the one a pre-colonial state in Africa that basically innovated trial by jury, a trial by jury of your peers. So what we think is interesting about the comparison is that Many of these institutions really do seem to operate in the way that we sort of think of when we think about the sort of states that might have inculcated people with this intrinsic willingness to obey rules. So that's why we think there's something general to learn from this particular study. Very good. Well, we're going to open it up to the audience. And uh, you should not quite ask your questions till the microphone comes around to you. And the microphone is now Descending on the right, gentlemen. We're going. So I'm interested. I'm I'm interested in the idea of formation of knowledge and wondering whether cross-cultural contact causes convergence of conceptions, and to the extent that it does, how does it happen? If the conceptions start as disparate. I would say definitely cross-cultural contact has an impact. Um, it's not always predictable. The uh, main contact that China had with the West initially came in the 16th century when Jesuits were sent out to convert the Chinese to Catholicism. But what ended up happening was that the Jesuits um, found it so difficult to teach their brand of Catholicism to a Chinese mindset that they made one concession after another and basically left out the Jesus part because that was too strange for the Chinese and um, took a lot from Epictetus, who's an ancient Stoic philosopher because it sounded more like Chinese thought than Christian thought. And in the end, one of the leading uh, members of the Jesuit visit, Matteo Ricci, was actually condemned by the Pope for twisting Catholicism into a shape where it was no longer recognizable. So I think um, there's an interesting model where you have a country that thinks of itself as, as at least this, you know, the, the European power, but what ends up happening is that it's more influenced by the country it's seeking to, seeking to persuade than vice versa. And this happens in different ways across the world. You have, um, for example, the contact of Western medicine with indigenous medicines or Western science with indigenous sciences often ends up expanding the West's idea of what science is or should be, rather than taking a new population and telling them, hey, you know, for heart surgery, this is where you cut to go back to, to Judy's point. So the answer is yes, but in unpredictable ways and fascinating ways. May I answer from uh, the point of view of my domain? Um, you know, I think that it depends on the level of abstraction at which you're looking. The idea of rights, for example, has spread all over the world. Every one of my documents has rights in them, more or less. Uh, but if you were to look at the particular configuration, the particular rights that were chosen, you wouldn't see much convergence. You see some that are almost universal, some that are really rare and innovative and quite local. And so, you know, I, I guess I'd say that cross-cultural contact increases 
similarity and convergence at one level of abstraction, but also allows for all kinds of possibilities for new fusions and new creations. I wonder if the Cuba kingdom uh, defined rights for its citizens. I, th I would I would say yes. I mean, they, they you know they don't think they knew much about Enlightenment philosophers, but I think uh, the scholars who looked at this would say there were well-defined rights. I mean, in the legal system, for example, you know there were very well-defined procedures for you know prosecuting different types of cases. People had to pay fines. There was a procedure. There was, and you know, I would say I would use the word people had the right to be tried or, you know, they had the right to this form of justice. Now, I don't know if in Bakuba, you know, what the word for right is. I can find out. Uh, <laughs> but, but to me, I don't have any problem using the word rights to talk about Cuba society. Yeah. Back here. Yes, sir. Uh, I imagine that some of you might be familiar with the name William H. McNeil, who did quite a bit of history writing about 50 years ago. And he comes to mind because of the, the reference to cultural, the question about cultural interaction and how much accommodation or divergence takes place. It's worth mentioning that much of his main thesis, especially in his early work, was to the effect that the main, by his lights, drivers of the interaction between peoples leading to these various results was changes in transportation technology, going from the, what he called the pedestrian era to the equestrian era, to the era of merchant shipping, to the mechanized transport that we have today. And then he later added to this, and there are others who picked up on this, the changes in media technology, starting with guys like Gutenberg. And insofar as any of you folks have any strong opinion on whether he was on the right track here, or are there things that you would add, I'd be very interested. I think it actually is, uh, it, you raise several really profound points about uh, change over time in the world, in, in a globalized world. Um, the changes in transportation um, that were indeed extremely influential, as Bill McNeil suggested, also led to the necessity of translation. And translation then becomes not just a kind of conceptual operation between languages that are written somewhere in the sky, but translation becomes an ongoing daily practice of people who are coming in contact with somewhat foreign or very foreign terms. And uh, in, in the case of, uh, you know, actually this relates to the former question, because I was, going, I was thinking about a case of the translation of science in modern China. There's a wonderful study by Wang Hui that points out that the kind of Chinese concept that was first appropriated as the meaning of the word science in early 20th century China was taken from a very ancient text in which the term investigation of things is the pivot around which all the conjunctions that can produce moral government and peace in the world are built. So investigation of things was the pivot that made it possible for the world to have proper sovereignty. This notion of investigation of things was taken up in the 20th century translation of science into Chinese. And at the same time, uh, a word meaning classification studies was adopted for the word science. So we have a kind of a putting together a kind of empiricist classification studies with uh, a very ancient idea of, uh, of investigating things uh, that, that becomes modern science for China. And his study leaves us with the question, what does science mean in China today then? In the back. Yes, um, this question is for Dr. Ginsburg. In what way do you find our current system to amending the Constitution insufficient to update it to be practical in today's society? And what would you suggest that we do um, to begin practically updating our Constitution? Right, so Article 5 of our Constitution has two mechanisms for updating, the one that everyone learns in, uh, in school of uh, 
Congress and then three quarters of the states, and that seems to have not been used very much in recent years, although the current uh, Republican majority is such that if they wanted to do that, they almost could. They're very close. Um, uh, but for that seems to have kind of gone by the wayside. Another idea, which we're actually fairly close to reviving, is the idea of a new constitutional convention. And Article 5 also refers to that. If enough states will, um, state legislatures will call for a new constitutional convention, we could have a new one. Um, I don't want to get into whether I think it's, you know, this should be done or not. I, on the one hand, I understand many of the critiques of the current American Constitution. Uh, but on the other hand, I really wonder if uh, in our current political moment we're in sufficient shape to have a rational discourse about good <laughs> institutions. It might be better to just let things evolve slowly, one step at a time, as they have been through other mechanisms, Supreme Court interpretation, congressional interpretation, et cetera. But it's a great question. It's on a lot of people's mind today. Over here on the sign. Hi, uh, this is actually for Dr. Robinson. Uh, so I have a question and then a follow-up. Um, and the first is just, did I hear you right that you said that the two groups involved, like one of them is on one side of the river and one is on another? Yeah. Was there any indication that there was a material difference in the resources available to the groups or some other underlying material cause that may have affected their development of government? So the, answer, so the answer is no. So we, we investigated that. I mean, I just I gave you a little sliver of the, the analysis. So, so there's many questions you could ask, you know, uh, use many challenges to establishing the finding that, that I stated. You know, one, as you're saying, you know, are there differences in resource endowments or whatever? And so we looked at that, ex, you know, extensively, and the argument, you know, the answer to that is no. And, you know, you might say, well, what about the Belgians or what about President Mobutu? And so we spend a lot of time investigating those kind of confounding factors. You know, it could be that President Mobutu t treated the Cuba differently than the people on the other side of the river. But, but the answer to all of that is, is we don't find significant differences in all these things. Uh, in the middle here? Yes, this uh, might be a follow-up question to the one uh, for Professor Robinson. Um, so you said there's a strong correlation between basically honesty and effective law enforcement. And um, at the same time, law enforcement doesn't necessarily influence honesty in a good way. How do you think then we should tackle the problem? Or where does, um, where does honesty come from, if not from effective law enforcement? I think, you know, the idea is that the state is sitting on top of a society with social norms and particular patterns of expectations about people's behavior. And so we should think just as much about that as we think about that, you know, we tend to think a lot about the institutional architecture of the state, the bureaucracy, the incentives of the bureaucrats, the fiscal system. And in the international development discourse, this discussion of the state kind of takes place without ever thinking about the society that it's sitting on top of. But I think if you think about something like, you know, law enforcement, you know, or tax collection, let me give you an example which, which, uh, which Professor Ginsburg and I have been talking about recently, you know, tax taxes. You know, you could think of tax collection as a sort of bureaucratic activity. You know, we have the Internal Revenue Service, they audit you, they... But actually, tax collection relies on enormous cooperation from society. It, 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 it rests on top of social norms that we should pay our taxes. You know, we get these services from the government. This is the right thing to do. You know, and so this is one of the things that I found most disturbing about the presidential election campaign, this attack on social norms underpinning the fiscal system. The idea that, you know, I'm so clever, I don't need to pay taxes. Now, you might say, so what, okay? That doesn't matter, we have a bureaucracy. Bureaucracy investigates, well, I can give you an example from Argentina. If you go back to Argentina in the 1940s, they had a very good fiscal system. They were very good at collecting taxes, and it collapsed. It collapsed in the 1940s and 1950s, it collapsed because people just stopped paying taxes, and it completely overwhelmed the ability of the bureaucracy to enforce the rules. So, so, so all state institutions work with an immense amount of cooperation from society, and I think it's easy to forget that, you know, and it's easy to forget in the United States how the Constitution works so effectively because of this enormous amount of cooperation from society. So I think that's, that's where I'd like people to focus. <laughs> 
We have time for one more question right here. Um, I guess this could apply to all your realms. I'm just going to talk about China. The, the basic question is how do cultures, uh, countries, decide which of the norms, their cultural norms, they're going to keep and which they're going to jettison and how do they hone it down? Just taking China as an example. Um, China has traditional Confucian society, yet it adopted Stalinism. Uh, China has traditional society, yet no culture has done more violence against the family, which is a Confucian value in the history of the world, and China has. Um, China did more than any country to flatten class divisions, and yet now it has the greatest wealth divide in the world. Um, you can put a gloss of cultural understanding on top of that, but China has worked very hard to wreck its culture. It rejected its culture uh, very extremely, and now it's opportunistically uh, asserting it again as a kind of political tool. And uh, it, it seems like this is something that is also worth exploring. How, how is the selection of the cultural values that happens in every realm made so that you, you keep what works for some people and you jettison uh, what's deemed dangerous maybe to the power elite? Yeah, that's a very good question and a difficult one too. Um, I would answer by focusing on two parts of the question. One is that you kind of made an agent out of China. China decided this and China jettisoned that. But obviously there's no such agent as China. It's particular people with particular interests at stake. Um, in fact, looking to their own self-interest largely at any given period in history that motivate these particular movements in one direction or another. Um, the other point I'd like to make is that I think we all have a gloss of ideology over reality. And while that's certainly true of China and the things you say are exactly right, um, I think we'd be hard pressed to find a place where ideology doesn't blind us to certain kinds of abuses in the system. So for example, in the US, um, we're all brought up in schools to think of ourselves as you know, uniquely democratic and uniquely fair and headed in the right direction. But there are a lot of problems with our system, too. I mean, what is the government doing about the terrible poverty in the inner cities? Um, why is it that um, we criticize the Chinese on human rights issues pertaining to a relatively small number of people while we are all too ready to overlook some of the huge rifts in our own society, that kind of thing. So I guess what I'm saying is, yes, I agree, but I think it's easier to point the finger at other people's uh, failings between ideology and reality, and we might be better served by looking at our own first. People don't get a choice about culture. There's, there, there are so many influences, so many forces happening as any great nation, any, any huge group of people, any population changes, modernizes, responds to the challenges of the present. I mean, I can't agree with most of the things you reported as facts in your question at all, as a person who spent a lot of time in China over my whole career. However, uh, I, I, I do think that it's fascinating to watch the collective life, the public culture change, and values seem to change. And at the same time, it's fascinating to watch how, uh, how stubbornly things like family remain strong, things like uh, an understanding of a dynamic body remain fundamental. You know, I think that people don't get a choice. Tom, you wanted to... Yeah, I think the, the question is, it, you've made a great case for kind of a Burkean approach to constitutional democracy. If you look at the history of the world, more people have been killed by their own governments than in all the interstate wars combined. And the reason, of course, is that you have governments that are truly unlimited, that think they can transform societies. And it turns out that most of those projects have at some level failed, just to, to give some to follow up on Judith's point. Well, that means that maybe we ought to sort of recommit normatively to the ideals of constitutional democracy and figure out how to make it work around the world. Well, our program has been called um, Against the Norm. One of the norms we're certainly not against is continuing the conversation. So now we invite you all to uh, some repast, food and drink uh, as you exit into the lobby.
We hope you've enjoyed this uh, pr presentation and have been enlightened by our program, uh, since the panelists and I certainly have been delighted by your participation. Thank you very much.